Welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. As you can see things are clearly a little bit different with the background. So I have just moved home so things are a little bit different but just bear with me while we eventually find somewhere to put everything and eventually we'll have a proper place to film. So for today's case we are talking about a police officer that was sadly taken down in the line of duty and as we know this is definitely not a once-off occurrence and this is definitely not something that only happens in South Africa and first responders put their lives at risk every single day for us and some of them sadly don't come home to their families and this is one of those tragic cases but before we jump into today's case last week we spoke about the Melanie Walner case and how she was kept hidden somewhere for years and if you haven't seen that I will link it here for you but that's enough from me and let's get into today's case intended for mature audiences only with the South African police force many men and women serve our country and serve us to protect us every single day. And the South African police force is filled with a lot of dedicated men and women who put their lives on the line every day and take pride in their work. But as we all know, there are a few bad apples out there, but that's not what we're going to focus on for today's case. Today we are going to follow the hardworking and very loved life of Leslie Silliers, who was a police officer in the South African police force for many years. Leslie Silliers was born on the 7th of December 1964. Leslie's close friends would describe him as loyal, loving and someone you always wanted on your side. When Leslie was a child he was very naughty, however he was also very quiet and very shy but he was a bit more extroverted when he was with his friends and people he trusted more. And Leslie had the special ability of making people feel as though they were the only people in the world and they were the only people who Leslie was really, really listening to. And close friends of Leslie always felt that he was always listening to their problems and their troubles and he would always be there to assist them where he could. When Leslie finished school, he immediately jumped into the police academy and that was really where he wanted to focus. So after a little while, Leslie was officially a police officer and he thrived and he absolutely loved his job. So after Leslie was a cop for a few years, he then met a lovely lady named Tyra. Tyra and Leslie became loved up quite quickly and they soon then became engaged. A year after they were engaged, they then got married and Tyra then decided to leave the police force because she then fell pregnant with their daughter named Roxanne. Leslie was absolutely absolutely besotted with his family. He loved his daughter Roxanne and he loved children just in general. Children were incredibly near and dear to Leslie's heart and he always wanted a family of his own and especially a big family. But soon after Roxanne was born, Leslie actually ended up creating and building a creche within the Danoon area in Cape Town. And the reason why he created this creche in Danoon was because he would often do police patrols there and he would see that the young children were often left to their own devices. They were left alone with not really any supervision sometimes, which is understandable when both parents had to work. And Danoon isn't a very high income community. So when parents had to go work, they would have to leave their children with whoever they could and with whoever could actually look after their children. And sometimes the carers who their parents put the trust in were not always the best. And sometimes the children would then be left to their own devices. But Leslie noticed there was a gap for a safe place for children to go during the day. So that's why he built the creche in the Danoon area. And Leslie was incredibly community focused. So even in his community of Tableview where he stayed, he would try and support the community as much as he could. And also now when he would do patrols in Danoon or wherever he would go, he would really look after the, or try to look after the community as best as he could. So back to Leslie's police career. Not only was he great with the communities that he worked in and that he loved, he was also an incredibly good officer and Leslie was given many options for promotions and for better wages and better income for his family but Leslie would turn them down almost as soon as he was offered them and the reason that Leslie turned them down was because if he became higher ranked in the police force that would mean that he would have to be desk bound and working at a desk was not what Leslie wanted to do. He wanted to be hands on in the community and he wanted to see the difference that he was able to make within these communities with that he worked in for so long. And the highest ranking that Leslie Silliers had before tragedy struck was that he was a inspector within the police force. So with that being said, let's get into the nitty gritty of this case and let me set the scene just a little bit. In July in South Africa, it is winter time, it is cold and it is rainy, depending where you are and in which province. 
but in Cape Town specifically in July it's cold it's wet it's raining it's storming but sometimes in winter we will get lucky with beautiful crisp winter mornings where the air is absolutely cold the breeze is blowing slightly and there's a smell of rain on the tar and on the 22nd of July 2003 Leslie was just starting a shift at the police station in Tableview and it was one of these beautiful crisp winter mornings where the sun was shining through the clouds and the ground was moist from the rain the night before and all seemed at peace. So Leslie Silius walks into the police station at Tableview, he's greeting all his friends and everyone in the police station is busy discussing a robbery that happened a couple of hours before when all of a sudden there's a cry on the radio, the radio starts cracking and police officers from the Atlantis area which is round about 30 to 40 minutes from Tableview are saying that eight men have now just robbed the bank and all police officers that are en route from Atlantis towards the Cape Town area need to be on guard because these guys could come from any road anywhere. So the police officers that were chasing the eight guys who have now just robbed the bank in Atlantis were following them and these eight guys were now heading in a van down the N7. So the Tableview police headed out as quickly as they could to start roadblocks along the N7 and also along any turnoffs that could take these guys off to the middle of nowhere and never be found again. So Lazy Silias and his partner at the time were given instructions to create a roadblock where there is a Durbanville turnoff so that the guys coming off the N7 could not take a turnoff to head it towards the noon. So Leslie and his partner then blocked the road called Contamans Clough Road and they were instructed to block this road in case the robbers decided to take that turn off, off the N7. Leslie and his partner were also instructed just to keep a lookout in case these guys sped past in the van and they were on the turn off, they could see then where these guys were headed. And sure enough, the exact place where Leslie and his partner were instructed to block off the road was where the eight men were headed for. So Leslie and his partner are now only two men blocking off the Contaman Clough's road and they now see this van approaching them over the hill. Like I said, it's a crisp winter's morning. There's no one on the roads. It's still quite early in the morning. And they see this van heading towards them. Leslie and his partner decided to think on their feet. And they would pretend that this was just a normal roadblock. That they were just checking license discs. And that nothing was expired and anything like that. So they see the van coming. And they then tell the van to start slowing down. So Leslie takes his flashlight out. And he starts flicking it at him to give him the indication that he now needs to slow down. So the van does slow down and Leslie then walks over to the driver's side and Leslie's partner then walks over to the passenger side of the van. Leslie Silias then asks the driver for his license and then a license is passed from the back of the van to the driver in the front of the van. Now the next incident to take place was incredibly unnecessary and it also just shows the blatant disregard for human life. So some accounts would say that all eight men were asked to leave the vehicle put their hands on the vehicle and then they were all searched. And once all of the men were out of the vehicle, they then all drew their weapons and they all shot Leslie Silias and his partner. However, other accounts would say that Leslie asked for the driver's license from the driver. And while apparently the driver was looking for his driver's license, one man was lying in the van on the floor. And as Leslie was being handed the driver's license, this man sat up from the bottom of the floor and shot Leslie Silias with an AK-47. However, with both of these different accounts, the police officers had no chance against these eight men who didn't care about anyone in their way. They knew that they had these AK-47s in their vehicle and they knew that one way or another they were going to use them. And Leslie and his partner were the two people standing in their way with all of this money and their freedom. So like I said, Leslie and his partner asked for the driver's license from one of the guys. And as he asked for the license, he also was about to look into the vehicle. When one of the men then stood up within the vehicle and took out a semi-automatic weapon and fired over 50 rounds into Leslie Silias's body. Leslie Silias then fell to his death almost instantaneously on the Contaman Clough's road. Lazy Silias' partner was also shot and as soon as all eight men realized that both officers were shot and lying on the ground, all of them then ran into the nearby open fields where they tried to run away from the approaching cops coming in the background. Backup police officers were there in a few minutes and they ended up catching six of the eight men. Lazy Silias was only 38 years old when he was brutally gunned down on Contaman Clough's road. And the trial for Leslie Silias was absolutely horrendous. Not only did they only catch six out of the eight men, but two out of the six men actually escaped being in prison and it took years for police to catch them. 
So this trial was delayed by four years from the date that Leslie was murdered and the men were actually caught. So once all six men were actually caught and in custody and no one was escaping and the trial could actually begin, the judge who was presiding over this trial, he called out continuously how callous and how heartless and, and how cold these men were throughout the entire trial. And even when images were shown of Leslie and his partner, they didn't even bat an eyelid. And even if there were emotions hiding between these men, because they maybe didn't want to show emotions, they really hid it very well. And the judge said it was difficult for him to look at these photos and he can't even imagine how Leslie's family felt. And the six men who were on trial never admitted to who actually murdered Leslie and they never would admit that. But in the end, the judge actually didn't really care who was the single trigger man or if there even was one single trigger man, he said that every single person involved in that vehicle was just as callous as the other. And he believed that all of them should be punished just as harshly. And when looking over the men who were actually on trial for this case, one of them was only 18 years old at the time of this incident. And all six men who were put on trial got sentences ranging from 16 years to 60 years. But that is not the end to this case. Three out of the six men who were put on trial got 60 year sentences each and the rest of the men got 16 years. The 18 year old was one of the men who got 16 years in prison. So for the Cilias family, they knew from the beginning that half of the men who were convicted of murdering their father would be on the streets by the time they are maybe 40 to 50 years old. However, they assumed that the other half, the three men who got 60 years each, would never see the light of day again. But then, in February of this year, an officer from the Department of Correctional Services contacted Roxanne, which remember is Leslie and Tyra's daughter, and Roxanne was contacted by someone in the Department of Correctional Services with regards to meeting up with one of the offenders who is now being offered parole for not even serving half of their sentence. So basically, one of the men who were given 60 years in prison was now being offered only around 20 years in prison before he was given the opportunity for parole. And Roxanne and her family were not having this at all. They were not impressed that this offender didn't even serve half of his sentence and the fact that they were actually being given parole in the first place. So basically, the correctional services wanted the Cilia's family to sit down with the perpetrators because they wanted and believed that there may be some rehabilitation that could be done with the family. And in one sense, I do get it. I do get that some prisoners are rehabilitated and they do understand what they've done is wrong. But what the correctional services wanted the Cilia's family to do in this case was that they wanted this person to apologize for their crimes to Roxanne and her mom. And in turn, they then expected Roxanne and her mom to then accept and forgive this person because he apologized. So yes, I agree in one hand, it could help the family to heal by hearing someone actually apologize for what they have done. And two, for the corrections department, it then ticks a box for the offender because then he can say, I've apologized, I'm now rehabilitated, or I'm on my way to being rehabilitated. It also then shows that the offender has then taken rehabilitation quite seriously, and it also gives them a better chance of getting out. So is it genuine? Is this really the way to go? It could be, and I'm sure it does help a lot of offenders and a lot of families. But for the Cilia's family at this point and in this year, they were not happy and they were not having it. So Roxanne and her mom Tyra did not want Kulani Kumalo to get out of prison or for him to have the opportunity for parole. Kulani was one of the men who was involved in the shooting of Lacey Sillias because he was one of the men inside the vehicle and one of the men who was given 60 years sentence. And because Roxanne and her family are actively trying to fight that the three men who were given 60 years sentences not be given parole, she has been calling the corrections department on and off almost every couple of weeks to find out where these men are, are they actually getting parole, and when Roxanne actually called the corrections department quite recently, they said that they do not know where the other two men who got 60 years sentencing even are, and all of the men were initially sentenced and sent to prison within Polesmore Prison, which is a maximum security prison here in Cape Town, so they were all in one spot. However, now they've all been separated and they are all in different maximum security prisons within South Africa. And even though Roxanne cannot get a definite answer as to whether any of these men are actually still in prison, 
she still tries to fight to make sure that none of them get parole. And I mean, with South Africa, it is possible that these men are all out in the street and we wouldn't even know. But we are just hoping that the correctional services did their best and they are still in prison and they are still serving their entire 60-year sentence. Roxanne also said that this entire process of trying to keep these men in prison to actually serve their sentencing is incredibly traumatic for her and her family because when the correctional department calls them or they want to talk about things, they have to keep bringing up events, they have to keep showing photos, and Roxanne has to talk to the department about the photos and how she feels and what happened. And Roxanne says that even though she's only fighting to keep Kulani behind prison walls, she hopes that she doesn't have to reopen wounds every time another offender who murdered her father is now eligible for parole. And she's also hoping that she doesn't have to re-victimize her family and her mother and herself every time the correction services wants to talk to them about her father's case. So Roxanne, her mom, and Leslie Celia's family are not out for blood. They just want to make sure that the sentencing that was handed down by the judge is actually served and they just want to make sure that life sentence means life. So this case just begs the question, is our South African justice system out there for the victims of these perpetrators or is our South African justice system out there to serve the perpetrators? Every single case is different and every single officer is different and I'm sure that there are hundreds of mitigating circumstances in every different case which may lead the perpetrator to do something or that may lead the perpetrator to get parole because of their background or because of something that happened in their life. And if no one is out there to protect the victims of these crimes, then who is? So that is the case of Leslie Sillias. Let me know what you think down below. Thank you very much for watching this far and thank you very much for your kind messages. You all really do make my day very often. So thank you for that. I hope you have a great day further. Please stay safe out there and I'll see you again next week. Bye.